Welcome to Computer Networks. This is Lecture 19. Just wanted to remind you that Homework 9 is due this week. I'm happy to talk about uh, any concerns, issues you might have with that in a minute. Homework 10 is out. I just posted it this morning. I don't know if anyone got a chance to read it yet. Uh, please take a look. It's, uh, it's interesting, in my opinion. We can have more discussions about this on the discussion board or, or in the lectures next week. Did anyone get a chance to read it? No, it was just a few hours ago. <coughs> Homework uh, 11 and 12 coming soon. Uh, we're still setting up the infrastructure for this homework. Um, and depending on what we manage to do, it might take uh, different directions. But just to give you an idea of what it is, you're going to implement a DNS server. Uh, in homework 11 to answer some very simple questions. So what, is, what does a DNS server do? Given a name, it provides an IP address, provides an IP address right? So we'll uh, implement that very basic functionality. And homework 12, uh, we'll do something interesting with it. I think uh, you'll enjoy it. And if you're interested in presenting some topics in the class, uh, please come talk to me you know, after, the, after the class, during my office hours, or propose a topic. Uh, that, that'll be the best way to actually work on something that, you're, that you find interesting, rather than me giving you a topic, right? Okay, homework nine. The idea is we use this tool called Wireshark to capture some packets from the wireless network and do some very basic analysis. And it asks you to, one of the questions there asks you to plot a CDF of some metric. Any problems, anything you want to share about homework nine? Did you say that uh, the Labby has a laptop we can use for that? Because the, yes. uh, the Wireshark can't get the, uh, the wireless plugins. Yeah, if you have trouble getting your laptop to work well with Wireshark, then you can get in touch with the TA and ask to use his laptop. It's working fine there. But it's also interesting to try to debug why it's not working on your laptop. So we managed to get it to work. Laptop, no one? Okay. Well, uh, it's worth trying, and if you feel like you're spending too much time, definitely get in touch with the TA. The point of this assignment is not to learn how to configure Wireshark. And there's already a trace on the assignment page. You should be able to just download that, open that using Wireshark, and explore various options that Wireshark provides. Any other questions? Who has started it? Who captured packets? Oh, download. That's a, <laughs> that's a good start, and some of you captured packets, so that's good. Yeah, and were you able to open the given trace file, or you haven't, you haven't gone there yet? Okay. If you run into any difficulty, please let us know as soon as possible. All right. Does everyone remember what a CDF is? Okay. If not, please go to the first maybe 10 minutes or so of last lecture. We had an example there. And you're supposed to plot a CDF. Any questions about homework 9 right now? I think you'll have some later. Please post them. Any questions about homework 10, 11, 12, at least the high level ideas, why we're doing it, what we're doing? All right, so today we're going to continue our discussion of link layer, particularly focusing on what is called media access and switching. Let's start with a simplified model of, a, of what a wired network looks like. For example, the network that connects our desktop computers in the computer lab. There's a, if these rectangles are hosts, then we need to connect them with wires so that they can exchange information. And here's a very simple model for 
what a network might look like. So if we have a network such as this, the question is, how can we enable one node to send a message to another node in the network? For a <coughs> network to be useful, we need to be able to send messages from one node to any other node in the network in general, right? So what are some of the features we need in a networking system so that we can achieve any-to-any -any communication? That is what we're going to be focusing our discussion on today. So link layer provides single hop addressing. For example, if we think about the network that I just showed earlier, we need to be able to say what is the destination for a particular message. Right? We can't just send a message. We need to say who is supposed to receive that message. So that's called an address or a name of a node or a host in the network. How do we, what do the names look like at the IP layer? We talked about that in the past. What, is it, what does it look like? 32 bits. It's a 32-bit integer. Right. So these addresses are a little bit different. Can you imagine uh, a reason why we might need different addresses? at the link layer. I'll give you a very I'll give you a simplistic explanation for why we might need it, and that doesn't go all the way to explaining why. Is there a reason for you to have a separate name, one individual, one person, uh, among your friends versus let's say the government? Among your friends you might just have a nickname, right? But if you the government wants to send a piece of communication to you, they typically don't uh, address that communication to your nickname. So there's a notion of different types of names or different types of objectives. Right? So in the internet, the objective is to be able to address any node across the internet. Right? In link layer, what is the objective? Just get it to the Get you the next node or address a node within your own local area network. So at least uh, we understand. I'm not saying these differences in objectives explain why these addresses are different, but we should at least understand there are different objectives to communication in these different contexts. Right? Okay. Here's another reason why we might need a different naming system or different namespace, at least. I might have you know, just one laptop that I'm using, right? But I might have multiple interfaces, multiple ways to connect to the network, right? I might have Wi-Fi, I might have wired, I might have 3G. So even though there is just one name for this machine, there are different ways to connect to the internet or to the rest of the network. So these interfaces, they are going to be able, they, they can receive and transmit a packet across the wires, the respective wires that they use to transmit information. And whenever you transmit an information, you need to be able to address it, right? So it turns out these interfaces, they have their own names, separate names. Why is it not enough to just use one name for all the interfaces that a machine might have? How do you differentiate between? Yeah, you might want to send different types of information across different interfaces. So there is a justification for having a unique name for each interface. If you, have, if you happen to have multiple interfaces on a single host. Are you convinced? Yeah, OK. So that's the that's addressing. The second idea is media access. Again, if you think about this network, we can't have all the nodes communicate at the same time, right? There needs to be a way for them to coordinate when they're going to transmit a message. 
let's think of a very simple example. Let's say, uh, uh, what's your what's your name? Steven. Steven. Okay. Uh, what's your name way out there? Yeah. Chiwa. Chiwa. Chima. Chima. Okay. This is Steven and Chima. They want to transmit some messages so that everyone can receive it. What are the possible protocols we might build? So they, they both should start yelling stuff out. Will that work? No, it's bad. Why, why is it bad? <laughs> yeah. You want to try? <laughs> so why will it not work? What are the potential problems? who are the intended recipients of the message can't understand it. Yeah, so the intended recipients of the message might not be able to understand it. And why might they not be able to understand? Because it's hard to understand someone when you've got multiple people yelling at you. Yeah, so it's hard to understand someone when there are multiple people yelling at the same time. Okay, what do you propose we, we do in that case? Some system for taking Okay, some system for taking turns. So let's say, and how, how would you bootstrap that system? Let's say you, you're in charge. So are you going to assign some time slots or what are you going to do? So we know what we're trying to solve, right? So one possible approach, which is a fine approach, by the way, that you know, we somehow come up with a way to take turns. I want to do round robin. Okay. So how do we bootstrap that system? Let's think of it in terms of a network protocol. So let's think about round robin, which is a legitimate solution, by the way. Okay, now let's let's focus on round round robin first of all. Um, or even simpler, let's say taking turn, even more general, right? So just think of it from a perspective of a node that is trying to transmit a message. And let's say you have to write a program. So what would that program look like? Just think very high level. Well, if there's only two people taking turns, yeah. you can say as soon as the other person stops talking, it's my turn to talk. OK, so one possible algorithm is as soon as the other person stops talking, it's my turn. Let's dig a little deeper. How do I know the other person is done talking? They say done. Done, OK. So one possible idea is uh, you listen for this word done right and if you hear that then okay the person is More done talking right so these are all actually good solutions and I think uh, in realistic situations this this will this will work for example uh, in the movies at least you know we hear about uh, we hear you know how people talk in walkie talkies <coughs> right what's the protocol that they have so that you don't cross each other Say over. Yeah, so they say, they say over whenever they're done, right? Now, there is one other complication. So that's part of the solution. There's one other complication. Let's imagine sound traveled really, really slow. What problem do, you, do we run into in that case? You may think the media is <laughs> available when it's not. Mm-hmm. Going, going back to this particular example, let's say Chima starts transmitting his message. No, so his message is still traveling while you start talking, so you can already start the talking. Ah, okay. So this is a new problem, right? So Chima starts talking, and there is this other person who also wants to transmit a message. And this other person is going to use, I'm going to start being a little bit more technical in my description. So this other person is going to tune into the channel using the receiver, right? And the receiver or the channel is idle or the channel is clear. But is the channel really clear? In this case, no, right? It's just, it's just taking its time. If somebody's propagating a login, but you don't know because it, it hasn't gotten there yet. Right, 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 right. Train train. Yeah. So, so the problem is we might think the channel is clear and we might start talking and what, what happens? What happens? Yeah. Then we have a collision. So how do we solve this problem? 
a handshake protocol, maybe similar to like how TCP or how HTTP opens up the communication database? Okay, let's try to prove that it won't work. <laughs> so, so you suggested some kind of handshake protocol. So what that usually means is someone says, okay, I'm going to start communicating or updating some value, and the other person says, okay, you can do it. Some kind of acknowledgement, is that what you're thinking? Yeah, but the problem, again, is, uh, you know, when do you say, okay, you can do it? Or right. Maybe you can have an intermediate uh, that, uh, you know, he coordinates who gets a message. Uh, he gets a message, so two people start talking at the same time mm -hmm. to the intermediate. He says, "Okay, I got a message from this guy first, so mm -hmm. he gets the turn." Okay. Uh, so, but so then how does he how does he tell people mm -hmm. whose turn it is without himself trying to broadcast into the medium where there's already a yeah. So the problem, I think that will solve part of the problem, not all of it, because you're imagining there's some kind of controller in the middle that says, hey, the sound waves from this person came first, right? You might be able to solve the problem, but there is an additional overhead, because you need to maybe just jam the entire network and say, tell everyone to stop, and then say, okay, now this person gets to start transmitting. But I, I hope you appreciate the problem here. And the reason we're talking about sound that travels really, really slow is because we're assuming that we're assuming something about the length of time it takes to communicate, the, the time interval for any communication. That's the reason we're worried about this. Let's imagine. The information that you wanted to transmit, you could transmit in a very short period of time, regardless of how fast or how slow sound travels, in which case we wouldn't have as serious a problem. Do you understand that? This is a problem if you have large amounts of information to transmit. Right? So let's say we have a very small amount of information to transmit, just a letter or two at a time. Oh, so the latency. The network is not high. So right. Sort of so uh, if we just have you know small letters, let's say we just need to transmit you know one letter per hour. In which case the probability of collision is pretty low. We can probably just ignore it. This problem becomes serious if we need to send a lot of information in a given time, right? Well, maybe you can send a small message first. Yeah. All right, I think you appreciate the problem now. So let's uh, get back to wired networks. What's the solution? Uh, we'll learn about the solution. Actually. So the process of getting access to the media for transmission and arbitra arbitrating that access, it's called media access. Basically, you're trying to access the media on which you're going to transmit information. So what's the media we're talking about when we're, when we're talking about sound? It's the air, right? What's the media we're talking about when we're talking about a wired network? The wires. The wires. And what's the media we're talking about when we're talking about a wireless network? The portion of the spectrum. Yeah, portion of the spectrum, perhaps, right? Okay. So do we understand now why we need a way to arbitrate access to the media? And, the, and why is that? Why do we need to arbitrate? Because there could be collisions. Right? There are two conflicting goals when we think about media access. One is we want to maximize the utilization. Right? So in, in, the, in the particular example we talked about, we could just come up with a rule that says um, you know, one student is allowed to speak just one letter every day, once a day, that's it. That would minimize the, what would that minimize? Collision. That would minimize the collision, that's great. But what's the problem? Uh, very low throughput. Very low throughput in our network, right, in our communication system. So we don't want that. So we want to maximize utilization. What's the problem that you run into when you try to maximize utilization? Some 
somebody that meant well, thinking not that he's just his parents would say it's starvation. Yeah, you, you might run into some starvation, or you might also increase, depending on the algorithm you're using, the probability of collision. Starvation is, uh, is basically addressed the second point here. If you want all the nodes to be able to uh, transmit a lot of messages, we have to be careful to make sure that all the nodes have an opportunity to transmit a message. Right? For example, let's say we come up with this arbitra arbitrating mechanism uh, when we're having discussions in the class. Let's say uh, you know, if you want to ask a question, if you want to make a comment, raise your hand. Let's say that's our protocol. Um, it's hard to ensure fairness just using that protocol. Is that true or no? It's extremely true. Yeah, it's extremely true. <laughs> that's right. So we need something additional to ensure that it's fair, right? Okay. So there are different approaches to how we might decide and the protocol to access the media. For example, you might do time division multiple access. What that means is we decide the times at which a device is allowed to transmit or transmit on the media or use the media. So we just come up with a schedule. So this node is going to transmit at time t. This other node is going to transmit at time t plus 1. This other node is going to transmit at time t plus 2, so on and so forth. So that's called TGMA. And there are other ways to part cleanly partition the media. We're, we won't get into that. But uh, I want you to at least understand the idea behind TDMA. And it's a pretty simple idea, right? Okay. Then there is the other set of approach called random access. And we won't go through all the details for all these mechanisms. But the idea is each node is going to decide using some mechanism and using some algorithm when it is going to try to use the media. For example, in this, uh, in this scenario that we said, two students, they're going to just try to decide somehow when is the right time to transmit a message, when is the right time to speak the message, right? And here's how... Um, we can describe the problem of collision that we talked about earlier. So let's try to parse this figure. Time runs from top to bottom. And we have two nodes. All right? Let's say the node on the right-hand side needs to transmit a message. That's what we're trying to do, right? The node cannot instantly know if there is an ongoing transmission, just like the sound example here, right? So it might sense the channel and say the channel is clear. So what are you supposed to do if the channel is clear? You start transmitting the message. And it turns out there is a transmission that's going on in the channel. And remember I asked you, so you know, how do we and develop a mechanism so that we can detect this type of scenario. And the thickness of these lines should give you a hint to design one of the mechanisms. So what does the thickness of the line tell you? How long it takes to transmit? Yeah. So if you transmit small amount of information, it's not going to be as thick, right, these lines. If you're transmitting large amount of information, these lines are going to get thicker. Let's imagine the node on the right-hand side was transmitting just a small packet. Would it miss the ongoing transmission? The blue lines, let's imagine the blue lines were very thin. Let's say just a line. In that case, would it detect that there is an ongoing transmission while it is still transmitting? It would miss it, right? So that should be a hint for one of the mechanisms you can use. So what should you do? If you want to be able to detect that there is an ongoing transmission, even though the waves are traveling pretty slow. Make sure it's empty for a certain amount of time, long enough for 
Yeah. Make sure your packets occupy certain amount of time in the channel to give you sufficient time to detect all these pending transmissions. That's the key idea here. There's a minimum frame size that you're supposed to use. Any questions here? Why it turns out transmitting small packets could be detrimental in this case. Because if we're transmitting a small packet, what would happen is the transmission from the other node would arrive after the transmission is complete. And now we'd be in a confused state as to whether the transmission reached the intended destination. I want everyone to understand this because this is kind of this is the key concept. <coughs> I'll do the minimum length. Minimum length. Okay. So, b before we get there, uh, let's uh, make sure everyone is on the same page here. So, if you don't understand this, I'm happy to explain it again. But this is a key concept here. So, what we're saying is that the only time we can detect a collision is if we're transmitting at the same time that we're receiving something from somebody else. Yes. Because that's the that's one of the def that's the collision at the transmitter, right? And the reason why we're interested in collision at the transmitter is if the transmitter knows that there has been a collision, then it can guess that there is probably a collision for some at some other nodes as well, and maybe I should retransmit, right? Because it's very likely that there are some other nodes that also experience the collision. And it's efficient for the transmitter to know this because it knows that it needs to retransmit without getting any feedback from the other node saying, oh, I didn't receive this message, I didn't receive that message. The transmitter knows right away that, okay, so there was a collision. So uh, I want everyone to understand this before we move on, before we try to answer your question. Do you know how thick do we want the lines to be? All right. Okay. So, how thick should the lines be? Any any ideas on how to answer that question? So, let's imagine these two nodes. They are separated by a distance larger, much larger than what we show on the slide. And try to extrapolate these lines. Keep the thickness the same. And just try to extrapolate. Imagine they're farther apart. I think you will reach a point where you will no longer see the collision if you keep the same thickness. Is that true? Are you convinced that's, that's the case? Imagine you move these two nodes farther apart. Keep the thickness of the line Why the, the same. Line bent? Why are they bent? Yeah, why did you bend it? The time oh. goes from top oh, to bottom. Yeah. 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 Even if it's small packets, um, if both of them wait for so long for the channel to clear, and say, okay, the channel's clear, and they can still recognize the channel's clear at the same time and then send it the same time anyway. And then they might collide, yes. This is not going to eliminate all the collisions. But before. To eliminate collisions yeah. is to help us make sure we know when there is a collision. Right. That's the idea. So, but be before we have these other discussions, I want him to be convinced. He seems okay, uh, seems not convinced. Still. Oh, I got it. I just, I just, at the beginning, I did I looked at the right side of the picture. Yeah. I didn't look at the time. So, OK, because uh, th this was confusing for at least one person. So why is this line slanted down? Why is that line slanted down? It's going down means it's going forward in time. And yeah. going to the right means it's probably going to cross the other. Because it, it's going to take some time for that signal to get to the other node. And that point in time is later than the time of transmission, right? And let's say there was another node here. That node would receive this transmission at this time. 
right? If there is another node here, it will receive or start receiving that transmission at that time. Does that make sense? So that's why it's slanted down. Does the thread stick on the on the line pointing down? I actually don't know what that stick is. Maybe that's just the point of interest intersection. I don't know what that uh, dip is. So let's do that thought experiment that I suggested. Let's imagine these nodes are farther apart. I think at some point, as you start moving them farther apart, the node on the right will not be able to detect collision because the transmission from node 1 will arrive at a time that's after the completion of its transmission. Right? Okay. So based on that thought experiment, you should be able to suggest now what determines that width? The distance. The distance between the two. It's the greatest time between the two nodes. Yes. And that's a fundamental limitation of local access networks, LANs. The wires that you use to connect two computers, they cannot be longer than a certain length. All right? Does that, does that make sense? So that's the reason why the wires cannot be longer than certain length. It's not because the signals are going to get weaker. Okay? Even if you have really strong signal, you will still run into this problem. And that's why you don't want the cables longer than a certain length. Now, how do you compute that length? Can you suggest a way to compute that length? Maximum efficient frame size that you can yeah. put these uh, without. Right. First of all, let's say we have this length in meters, right? The distance between two nodes, so the length of the wire. And let's say I give you the speed at which the signal propagates in the medium, right? Will you be able to? compute how big the frames should be. Is a frame just a unit of time? Uh, let's, say, let's say actual just time. Rather than data, just to simplify, let's just say time. Will you be able to compute the length of the frame in time? Well, don't you have to know? You should be able to. Yeah. You should be able to, right? Now, once you know the time, depending on the technology that you're using, which will determine in you know, bits per second, you can compute the length of the frame in bytes. Any question? Just to recap, let's imagine we have these two nodes that are trying to transmit messages to each other and to other nodes in the network. The problem that we're trying to solve here is the collision. And turns out that's a pretty hard problem to solve. Now, can we at least detect the collision so that we can retransmit, right? So how do we detect collisions? Well, when you are transmitting, if we hear some other node's transmission, then we know that there is a collision in at least one node, which is itself potentially other nodes as well. Now, in order to ensure that we receive transmissions from any other nodes while we're still transmitting, we need to make sure the messages are of certain length, right? And it turns out there's also a dependency in terms of how far apart the nodes can be. That's the summary. All right, so we're going to do a quick case study using Ethernet. It's a dominant wired LAN technology. Right? We all use Ethernet, I think, at least at the computer lab, not at homes anymore. And it uses something called carrier sense, multiple access, collision detection. And my hope is you can understand what these phrases mean now. What do you think carrier sense means? Yeah, you listen to the medium. What does multiple access mean? It's designed to have multiple uh, yeah. nodes talking. Yeah, multiple nodes being able to access the media, 
right, and use the media. And what is collision detection? You can detect the collisions using the mechanism and the physical constraints that we just described. All right? I think you understand um, all the concepts necessary to understand at least the traditional Ethernet at this point. So we're going to just go through some of these slides. Now, if you look at the Ethernet specification, they're going to talk about length. Why do they talk about length? You should be able to answer that question now. Because of the size. They probably pick the size of the frame. Probably, yeah. Frame, sorry. Right. Does everyone understand that? Because if you look at the specification, they'll say at 10 megabits per second, okay, there's the length. That's what they will say. That's what the specification will say. Now we know why, right? Okay. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about that. But even if you use a repeater, let's say we're virtually creating a single wire across which everyone is connected, you are still going to have that constraint. Right. I'll just know the difference. Yeah. So here's the transmit algorithm. The line is idle, transmit immediately. And there's an upper bound on the message size. And there's some gap between the messages. Again, we won't go into the details of uh, intricacies of all uh, these constants. But the key idea is sense for the channel, you try to detect a collision, and if there is a collision, you do some backup and retransmission. All right. So it turns out in Ethernet, if there is a collision, you actually jam for a certain amount of time, just so that everyone in the Ethernet have an up they have an opportunity to know that there has been a collision. Remember, the collision is detected at the transmitter, right? Even in a particular transmission scenario, not every node is going to detect the collision. Is that true or no? Right? Because even in, if you go back and look at the network that we drew, we just had two nodes, right? It could very well be the case that there is some other node far away, and that, will, that node will not detect the, transmit, uh, the collision. So you actually jam the channel so that everyone knows about the collision, and uh, once you know there has been a collision, you can try to retransmit. So why do we have a minimum packet size? Okay, and why do we have maximum network diameter? Yeah, so to detect collision. Because uh, we hard coded the memory. Yeah, and these standards actually hard code these numbers, right? And there's the question of you know, when to retransmit. And someone suggested earlier that it could very well be the case that there is no transmission happening in the channel, and two nodes might correctly determine that there is no transmission at a given time, and they might both transmit at the same time. Uh, sure, we can't prevent that using this mechanism. We can only detect such collisions. The question is, you know, once we detect a collision, when should, when should we retransmit? And here's an algorithm used by Ethernet. It's called exponential backoff. So if there is a collision, you wait for a certain period of time, and that time is given, or time is picked from that particular distribution. I want you to be able to compute these distributions. For example, you should be able to say, OK, if this is the third backoff, then what is the possible, what are all the possible wait times until there is a retransmission? Can we guess why this might be? a reasonable way to compute the wait time. Because the simplest way to compute the wait time is to just say, if there is a collision, you know, wait for 50 milliseconds and retransmit. 
that would be a lot simpler, right? Why, why do you want to bother with something more complicated? Right, so the problem with that very simplistic approach is, let's say we have two nodes, and they start transmitting at the same time, they collide, at, collide, and they're both going to wait for 50 milliseconds, and then retransmit, and what's going to happen? It's going to collide again, right? So let's modify that a little bit. Let's say we use time between 0 and 50 milliseconds, but we pick it randomly in that interval. Right? So, so here's the algorithm. If there's a collision, pick a random number between 0 and 50, and that's your wait time. And once that timer expires, you retransmit. So what's wrong with that algorithm? Not really random. Let's say it's very random. Let's say it's truly random in that range. If you're just picking arbitrary wait times, then you're going to have more collisions because there's a set. Mm -hmm. Your frame, your uh, your frame length falls within certain ranges, mm -hmm. and you have to. So you want to pick your random distribution so that it sort of falls between increments of those ranges, so that when your timer runs out, usually someone else who just and who immediately retransmitted will have just finished. Mm -hmm. I sort of buy that, but that's not the that's not getting it getting to the heart of the difference between exponential backoff and just using a, ra a random number within a fixed range. Think of a network with two nodes, and think of a network with a million nodes, and think about what happens when there's a collision. Can you say that again? Millions of nodes. Yeah. So, so the key difference is the back of time does not really scale with the network. For example, if we have a network, if we have a very large network, we want the backups to be a little bit longer, right? Just so that uh, we wait proportionally to the amount of time we might be able to get access to the media. Does that make sense to everyone? And the problem with a very small network is, let's say we pick 50 milliseconds, but turns, so in average, it might be 25 milliseconds of wait, right? That might be very inefficient if there are only two nodes in the network. Do people understand this argument? So there could be problems at the two ends of the spectrum. So the key challenge, if you just want to use the uniform distribution with fixed lower bound and upper bound is we don't know what the right upper bound is, right? Because in a small network, we want uh, the wait times to be relatively short so that we can use, make an efficient use of the media. In a large network, we want this range to be large so that we don't collide too often. But you know, we don't want to be, program our computers every time someone adds a node to the network or every time someone removes a node from the network, right? We don't want to do that. So it turns out exponential backups have this property. Any questions about that? Okay. It turns out even with all the mechanisms that we talked about, there's still one problem which is called capture effect. So the idea is when we have two nodes transmitting messages, it is possible for one node to dominate its use of the medium. How does that happen? Let's think about this. So let's say for whatever reason, node A currently is using a larger interval, you know, using the exponential back of algorithm, right? For, for example, let's say its packets got dropped, you know, two or three consecutive times, and then you increase the size of your interval, your wait time, right? So A is using a longer time. And let's say when A's interval is large, B starts transmitting. 
it transmits a packet and it transmits another packet and let's say there is some collision but it's not going to increase its window to a large interval immediately right so b is basically dominating the media now let's think about what happens when it's a is time to transmit the packet so it's going to transmit a packet and b is also transmitting a packet right and there's a collision so what is b going to do when there's a collision So when there's a collision, what's the algorithm? You back off, right? But B didn't have any packet drops before this collision. So it's going to back off just a small amount. It's going to double the interval, but you're starting at a very small interval because it didn't have any, um, it didn't have any drops. How about A? Yeah, it's also going to double its interval, but it had drops in the previous attempts, so it's going to double from the large interval that it already had. And if you continue this experiment, you know, after a while, A's back of timer is going to expire, B is continuously transmitting in the media, and uh, they're going to transmit at the same time and there will be a collision. And what is B going to do? It's going to back off, but it's still going to be a small interval, right? Because it didn't have any packet drop earlier, and A is also going to back off but it's going to double the already very large interval. So do you understand how B comes to dominate the use of the medium? That's called capture effect. B was able to capture the channel. So in the previous slide, we said exponential backups are great. It helps you scale. Regardless of the number of the nodes in the network, in a stable state, you will hopefully have the right back of intervals, but it turns out here is a problem. So how do we solve this problem? So does everyone understand the capture effect? Good question, actually. Yeah. Um, at what point do you stop? You're, you reset your matches, basically. Like, say you mm -hmm. don't have any collisions for three days. Mm -hmm. Are you going to continue forever increasing your backup every time? Oh, so or is there a timeout in this only, algorithm? You only increase your backup on consecutive collisions. Yeah. Okay. And then as soon as you have a successful transmit, you reset it. Yeah, you reset it to the minimum interval. You also reset it when you set the timeout to like 16 or something. Yeah, so, so one of the solutions might be to put a cap on how large the interval can be, right? Can you think of any other solutions to... Uh, first of all, do we all understand capture effect? All right. So, uh, what are the solutions to this problem? All right. Something for you to think about. All right. I have a maybe solution. Okay. Yeah. If you have had a lot of, uh, like, if you've had a lot of collisions or whatever, so your range is big, like maybe weigh it more heavily towards the beginning of that range. Mm -hmm. And then if you haven't had any, maybe weigh it slightly heavily towards the end of the range. Okay. So one of the solutions that was proposed was. If you had a lot of collisions, then you pick a random number in the first part of the range with higher probability. Basically, you skew the distribution from which you're picking the random number. Is that your solution? So does that uh, help with this problem, or no? What do you think? I mean, well, it would have to be zero. I think it helps with this problem, but it makes things worse when you've got a whole bunch of nodes, mm -hmm. because you're going to have more collisions than and because your collision is not because other people are dominating the medium, but just because there's so many people trying to use it, yeah, you just are going to front load their attempts. Yeah. And you're have more so, problems. so in a sense, your modification to this algorithm is making the nodes more aggressive about their use of the media, right? Because the nodes are now likely to pick a shorter interval, and that just makes them more aggressive, and that could exacerbate the problem. Okay, I want you to think about how to solve this problem, okay? All right. So earlier we talked about addressing, how we name the interfaces. Uh, some of you probably already know what are called MAC addresses. These are the names that we assign to interfaces. Let me show you how I can find the name or the number of my interface on my laptop. So I could go here. I could go to System Preferences. 
it go to network and this is an interface that I have advanced and I can go to hardware and that's the address of my wireless card okay uh, let's do something so it turns out these numbers are allocated by an organization so that so it's possible to uniquely identify who the manufacturer is just by looking at the number. And it's also the case that this number is unique across all the network devices in the world. And it turns out if you just look, look at the first part of the number, you can tell who the manufacturer is for this network interface. So what's the first? Let's just remember that, 60C5. You can go to this page. So, who is the manufacturer of this wireless device? Okay. All right, let's do another quick exercise. Oh, it came in this screen over here. Has anyone used command called if config? Yeah. There we go. So if I use the command if config, it'll list all the interfaces that exist in a given machine and the IP address and the hardware address. Uh, for example, there is an interface called eth1 f1. This is the IP address of that interface, for example. And here's the hardware address. So what are the first few numbers? 0023. Just remember that, OK? 0023. Oh, um, what is it? That is where, or that's the manufacturer that built this particular network interface. So how can you make sure these numbers are unique? We need an organization that allocates these numbers. Right? And deallocates, hopefully. Because that's, that's hardwired into the device. Yeah. If you destroy all of your devices, then so if, yes. If you want to deallocate an organization, yeah. you have to know that all of their devices have been destroyed. Yes. Otherwise, you risk misidentifying. Yeah. So you not only have to uh, just you know find the products that are still in the stores, but you have to go find all the customers who bought that product, and you have to destroy all that. But it only allocates to the organization. Yes. Right. So you get the first three digits from this organization, and then as a manufacturer, you have to make sure the last six digits are unique. All right. And just a quick word on Ethernet efficiency. One of the reasons for inefficiency in Ethernet is these collisions, right? If we could, if there is no propagation delay, 
would that increase or decrease the efficiency of the internet of, of Ethernet? Let's say the signals travel instantly with no time. Yeah. Because if the signal trans traveled instantly, you would know instantly if there is another transmission that's happening. So that would increase the efficiency, right? How about uh, if you're transmitting a very large packet? Let's say and you increase the frame size to a very large frame. Would that increase or decrease the efficiency? Why would it increase it again? Yeah. Yeah. Delay. Yeah. So why is that? Why does that increase the? You're really only at risk of a collision at the beginning of your transmission. And as soon as you capture the channel just once, then you just transmit forever. Right. For example, that's the extreme case. All right. So what we talked about until now is different protocols and techniques that allow us to address as well as send messages when we have a network that looks like what we have on the slide and in the previous lecture we talked about how can we detect if there is packet corruption and remember we talked about integrity checks in the packet checksums and so forth and also if there is a collision or if there is a packet uh, corruption how we might retransmit those packets to make them more reliable. That is what we talked about last time. So any questions? No. All right. So let's take a very short break, and we're going to continue our discussion, the link layer. What's 16 to the power of 6? Because if you have only 6 numbers, they're hexadecimal. Yes, hexadecimal. Then the company So yeah, so each organization has oh, so more the than the full IPv4 address space. Yeah, okay, the rest was just not displayed. Pretty large space. And you could always uh, get uh, more allocations for a single organization. There's no rule that you can't have more. They're not routers. Subs, whatever, <laughs> switches, whatever. They're switches. I can't see. <laughs> I can't see his neck here. Yeah. Are those for but us? We'll, ta we'll talk about switches next. Are they for us? They're for me. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, we're going to talk about switches uh, in a few minutes. So do we have a student presentation today? I don't think so. Are you presenting today or on Wednesday, right? Yeah. Okay. Doesn't the current 802.11 standard use CSMA CD? Um, what do you mean by current? Um, do you mean all, all, actually, don't all the 802.11 use CMA I don't know the answer. Let's see what they say here. <laughs> I don't know the answer. I, I'm pretty sure the current standard is G. Yeah. I thought it used CMS. It, it might, but... This idea of shared medium um, doesn't exist anymore in the way we you know, have network equipment you know, designed, built, deployed. 
it's more of a traditional explanation for this technology. So I think uh, we should just uh, get started. All right. So let's think about scaling the type of networks that we talked about just now. So we have hosts connected with wires. So that is what we've been talking about. So what are some of the challenges that we expect when we try to hook up more and more computers, more and more hosts to the network? When we have a lot of nodes on the same wire, we're going to have a lot of collision. Right? And the capacity will also be diminished. Why is that? How many nodes can transmit a message at a given time if there's just one wire connecting all the nodes? Only one. Only one. So that's a problem, right? So what's, what's a potential solution? More wires. More wires. <laughs> More, wires. <laughs> More wires does not necessarily solve this problem. We want to cut the wires, actually. Right? We want to organize the network into multiple segments. What are the consequences to this, though? So if we cut the wires and put various hosts on different segments of your network, it actually complicates the network design. Because earlier, it was very easy. You have to transmit a message to anyone. Just transmit it on the wire. and the recipient is guaranteed to be on that wire, right? So what's the problem when we start segmenting the network? Now you need to know the segment on which the intended recipient is, right? Earlier, everyone was in the same segment. Very little Ethernet today is shared. They're all segmented networks today. Yeah. And switches, these are the boxes. I'm going to pass it around. So th these are very different from the routers at home. I'm going to pass around the box. This one has an actual switch. So this, this is what a switch looks like. The main difference that you see from the wireless access points that you might have, might have at home is it does not have different types of connection here because the router that you have at home might have one port or telephone or cable or something like that. And it has much larger number of ports. I'm going to pass this around as well. So we use these devices called switch to connect different segments of a network. Now imagine we have different computers hooked up to those ports, right? Because that's what we're trying to do. We have different computers hooked up to those ports. When a packet comes into the switch, the switch needs to be able to determine the port on which it should forward the packet, right? That's the main challenge, and that's the, that, is, that becomes necessary only because we have network organized into different segments. Earlier, we didn't have to do that. Why is switch is much smaller than I don't know. I don't know why the switches are smaller than the regular routers. Maybe it needs less hardware. Maybe it needs less hardware. Maybe they try to make you think you get something big as a router. I mean, the one that uh, I have at home is bigger than my laptop. It's bigger than your laptop. Together with the back. It's a dual. It's a general. It's a general. And it's from. I don't. I I don't know why the know. home routers like, are like, physically it's much like larger. It's is Maybe. Like an enterprise? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I have to do a heat. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. I don't know why it's physically larger. What? 
there's like it, it, it might also have a modem, and depending yeah. on the technology that you're using, this modem, modem is also going to require some physical space to modulate and demodulate the signals. So let's imagine we have a network with switches. Can you identify a switch on this diagram? <laughs> that's the symbol that's typically used to describe a switch. And it's also labeled switch one, switch two, switch three. Right. <laughs> okay, good. So when, when we send a packet on the network, we need to have a destination address, just like uh, in a single segment network. Remember the challenge that we talked about. A switch needs to know the port on which it should forward a packet. Right? Because we don't want to broadcast it on all the ports. Why is that? Why do we not want to broadcast a packet to all the ports? Yeah. Because what we're trying to do is create separate segments. We would, effectively, we, will, we would effectively create a single segment if we start broadcasting on all the ports. So that's the main challenge. And can you suggest a way in which we might solve this problem? So we know, we know our goal. Our goal is, what is our goal? Send the packet on the, on the right port. Right. Yeah. So how, how do we accomplish that? So let's say we have switch two. And we get a packet along this line. says destination host B. On which port should that switch transmit that packet? Port zero. So can you come up with an algorithm that we might run on that switch? Routing. It's similar to routing that we talked about. It's very similar to that. Basically, we need a table on the switch that tells us, for a given destination address, what is the port on which we transmit a packet. Okay. Let's imagine a much sim simpler scenario before we get to the more complex one. Let's say I have the switch that I, that I had a few minutes ago. And let's say I had just connected maybe three computers to it using separate wires, right? And computer one is going to send a packet saying destination computer three. So just for this very simple scenario, can you come up with a, a system that would learn this kind of table? We have computer 1 on port 1, computer 2 on port 2, computer 3 on port 3, all hooked up to the same switch. Computer 1 transmits a packet saying destination 3. Starts trying to, um... So what does it have in the table right now? It's got nothing. So what's, what should it do in that? Just going to start everyone that's not, the, not in, the sender. In, in that case, maybe send on all the ports that is not the original sender, right? Okay. Now. But should it also put one in its, in its table? So yeah, we're getting there. We're getting there. So now, let's say computer three sends a packet to computer one. So on which port does the packet come in? Port 3, right? Computer 3 is going to port 3. Now, what does the switch do? Yeah. So now it knows that it received a packet from computer 1 on which port? Port 1 earlier, right? So on which port should it transmit this packet? Port 1. Does that make sense? So it will just transmit it in port 1. So this is how you learn the table. Any question about at least the very simple scenario? It's pretty simple. You just uh, take a note whenever you receive a packet. You know, what is the source address and on which port did you receive that message? And any time you need to send a packet to that destination, you just go look up that table and say, ha, ah, there was a packet that came, to, came from this source on this port, so I'm just going to transmit it on that port. That's the idea. So you maintain a table 
That looks like what we saw on the slide. So it actually knows which host it came from. It doesn't. It can see more than one segment. I guess. Yes. Well, the the switches won't change the packets. The sw oh. Yeah, the switches won't change the source. Yeah. A router would change the source. Right. So any question about the idea? So what we've been doing is rather than me telling you, okay, here's the algorithm, here's this other algorithm, you've been you know, designing these algorithms and protocols, and turns out the solution is not that different from what you can imagine. And I think that's a better way to understand these concepts anyway. If you put the destination in the table, uh -huh. you have to wait to get back before you know which output it goes to, or anything You already know, right? Because you received the source. We're saying well, if you okay. receive one that you don't know where it you goes, don't know where it goes. Uh -huh. so you're going to send it up to all three and wait until long you get something from one of those. Yeah, you just you just don't know so on which port. So you don't you just don't you don't ask it. you don't ask the people you're connected to. You just say. You that's the simple. That's the they send right. That's the simple algorithm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And this is a connectionless model because. We are doing the switching on a frame by frame basis, right? Okay. So, what we're trying to do is not forward a packet where it is not needed. That is what we're trying to do. And we learn host locations based on source addresses. Location being, you know, which segment it is on, right? All right. So now, finally, one last topic, which is this idea of loops in a network. Why might we have a loop in the network? Sometimes it could be a configuration error. Sometimes we might require, we might desire redundancy. These B's are the switches. And these lines, the horizontal lines, are the segments in this diagram. And there are some vertical segments as well. Can you see a loop formed by B1, B4, and B6? There's a loop there, right? Can you go up with a scenario when you might have packets being forwarded endlessly in that loop? Can you think of a scenario? Maybe when initially um, yeah. six or four were trying to get to each other, third and then down, and then they sent it off and then mm -hmm. said, oh, well, I can send things to B1, and B1's like, oh, well, I have packets for B6, I send it to B4, and then B4 will be able to send that. So I think uh, that'll probably work, but uh, here, here's an example that's even easier to understand. Let's say there's a packet that's coming from a node on segment J to segment, let's say, far away. Let's say segment A, right? And uh, that packet was received by B4, and what is B4 going to do? So it's going to send on all the segments, right? And B6 is going to receive that, and what is B6 going to do? going to send all the segments. And B1 is going to receive that. And what is B1 going to do? It's going to send on all the segments, including H, right? And B4 is going to receive it again. And it's going to do what? So you, you get the idea, right? To solve that problem, what we can do is run a distributed spanning tree algorithm in the network and pretend that some of these links don't exist. And what that means is we virtually disable a port. We don't use a particular port. 